This talk is about perception systems for autonomous vehicles using energy efficient deep neural networks. Um, so uh, I'm Forrest Iandola. Um, uh, this is a, a presentation that a lot of people have contributed to over the years, uh, but in particular, Ben Landon, Kyle Bertin, and Kurt Kreutzer uh, of DeepScale, uh, as well as some of our other colleagues, uh, uh, a lot of credit to them for, for um, putting all this together. So um, diving in here, uh, I'd like to kind of just level set on terminology. So when we think about an autonomous vehicle, there are a lot of components to that, and some of them are still being defined and figured out because it's a pretty um, kind of emergent technology area. But um, broadly, four of the most critical pieces of an autonomous vehicle um, are sensors. So naturally, this being a, an imaging conference, we know lots about that here. You probably know more about it than me. Um, those sensors um, serve as inputs to a variety of other systems in the car, uh, most critically the perception system. So perception, some people call it computer vision. Uh, I like the word perception because it's sensor agnostic. Uh, so applying algorithms to make sense of, uh, you know, going from, from pixels and bytes to what really is the semantic content of our environment as well as its 3D position. Um, the complement to that is, is high definition offline maps. So those maps typically, um, you know, they're, they're in three dimensions uh, as much as can reasonably be annotated uh, of the static objects in the environment have been. So um, things that don't move very often, uh, like the lanes and the signs and so forth, uh, should be on the maps. And then naturally there's an interplay between those two where the perception system captures the dynamic objects which gets superimposed onto the map. Uh, together, all this forms an environmental model which goes into the path planning and actuation system which figures out where would we like the car to go and how do we manipulate the car's actuators to accomplish that. So naturally, um, uh, so our company, DeepScale, focuses primarily on the perception piece. Um, and that's what I've been invited to talk uh, about here today. So that's what I'm going to do. And so let me spend a few minutes on what does a car really need to see? Um, to drive, and this is sort of an unbounded problem because as humans, we know that as we, as we drive, there's, there always are more things we could look at, more data that we could um, uncover around us to further improve our driving decisions. So here I'm just gonna start with the basics and, and leave it to your imagination to fill in all the other things that I don't have time to, to uh, give as examples. So um, you want, sorry, this is really small because it's actually a very kind of fine-grained problem, so you want to detect all the, the critical dynamic objects. So you have non-vulnerable objects like vehicles, um, which, I mean, you know, vulnerability is sort of a continuum. The most vulnerable objects tend to be unprotected you know, uh, un, uh, pedestrians, motorcyclists, and bicyclists, where if you collide with them, there's a very high chance they'll be seriously injured or killed. Uh, vehicles that have occupants in them and are moving around are um, much less vulnerable to injury, although it's still, still a big concern. Uh, parked cars, for example, um, you know, you don't want to hit them, but the damage uh, to human life is going to be lower. So you, you kind of have this taxonomy of the vulnerability of the object as well as its category, uh, vehicle, pedestrian, uh, and you could divide it into hundreds or thousands of categories potentially. Uh, you want to track the objects uh, and figure out their range from you. Um, so how far away? is it, and ideally to put them in three-dimensional space. Um, here for simplicity, I've just drawn uh, rectangles, bounding boxes, but what you really want is a 3D box uh, for each object with its extent, uh, its roll pitch and yaw and so forth. So you have as much as, you know, up to a, depending how you think about it, a six to nine degree of freedom object detection problem uh, with how far away it is, uh, what's its 3D box, and what's its roll pitch yaw. Um, and then you start to think about uh, where can I drive? So um, here, the, the, the darkest green is where my current lane is. The lighter green is um, where else can I currently drive um, safely and legally. And then the yellow on the other side is, that is road, but it's actually not drivable road for me because it's out of, out of reach for me and it wouldn't be legal for me to go this direction in, in those lanes. So um, uh, this is just one of many example problems that can be framed as what we call semantic segmentation, so labeling every pixel uh, based on what object category it's a member of. Uh, here, for simplicity, we're just showing different types of drivable area, but naturally, um, everything in the scene could be labeled 
uh, in this manner as, as some sort of semantic category. And then, um, you know, just, just for completeness, you, know, you also want to know where the lanes uh, that you're, you know, the ones you're in, the other ones that are, are available, uh, where's the center of the lane uh, that, that you're looking at. Um, and an interesting thing about this is, well, there are lots of papers on how to do this sort of thing, but one challenge that I'll get to in a minute is it's hard to do all this in a limited computational budget. It's a lot easier to do this with a trunk full of state-of-the-art you know, computing servers costing hundreds of thousands of dollars. The other issue is, um, well, so there's a, a, another conference that, that runs every year called CVPR, or Computer Vision and Pattern Recognition, uh, or ICCV, or there are others. So CVPR, there are lots of papers every year about how to solve problems like these. What's lacking is there aren't very many pap CVPR papers about how to combine a bunch of CVPR papers into a unified model of the environment. So that's something that I think currently is more kind of lore or, or trade in industry secret sauce right now. Um, so, and, and I'm not sure I have any kind of final resounding lessons on how to do that, except it's a lot of hard engineering work to, to um, get all this registered together, as opposed to just saying, got one model that knows about lanes, got one that knows about cars, They're just kind of different things. You, you want that all together. Right, so hopefully I've given you at least a rudimentary idea of what kind of thing you want to see when driving, or, you know, in order to drive effectively. Naturally, this is just scratching the surface of the kinds of things you want to know. Um, people from, from Waymo or Cruz will Will, would point at this and go, yeah, that's about, about, about a one-hundredth of, of the overall complexity of what you want to see. I would agree with that, but it's hard to annotate all of it at the same time. Right, so I guess um, what, what I'm seeing right now out there is a lot of companies have built prototype autonomous vehicles that at least in certain conditions can drive reasonably well. But if you open up the trunk, you find a lot of computing power. So this is, a, this is an image that was released by Audi uh, maybe, maybe a year or two ago. Uh, this is what BMW and Intel were showing not so long ago. Uh, this is something from Ford. Um, you know, if you, if you Google image search autonomous driving server, you'll, you'll find endless stuff like this. Um, and naturally, you know, Waymo, for example, is too secretive to tell you what's in there. But if you ever pull up behind a Waymo car, there's a little label printer printed sticker that says, Something to the effect of, please do not use trunk, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's full. <laughs> you know, put, just bring your luggage and kind of put it on your lap or something. Um, so so um, I guess let's spend a minute on, you know, what are the implications of doing autonomous driving uh, like this? So first of all, um, not just the trunk space, but big computers lead to cars being quite expensive. So, you know, I routinely see people talking about, you know, in this article, $250,000 to fit a vehicle for, for uh, uh, level four autonomy with relatively limited ra uh, you know, range of operation, geofenced. Um, and I've, I've heard numbers even higher than that. So you know, this makes the vehicle very expensive. Um, also, you know, on a reliability perspective, you know, these, these um, uh, very high-end servers with GPUs are amazing technology, but they're not designed for automotive constraints, uh, which, which uh, you know, it's, automotive parts should last 20 years, you know, in fleet operation still should last many years. Um, these um, parts are designed to run in the cloud in servers where they're obsolete in three years and thrown away, not 20, right? So there are lots of issues with the server and the trunk thing. Um, and um, maybe most principally because of the cost and secondarily because of the longevity, the reliability, um, uh, the power dissipation required. And so that means we can't do this anymore. And so the first place a lot of people look for um, uh, how do we reduce cost of autonomous vehicles tends to be sensors. That's coming down. Um, there are lots of projections about how sensors are improving. There are people also who are doing uh, more with cameras and becoming a bit less dependent on LiDAR, which currently is by far the most expensive type of sensor in autonomous vehicles. Um, I, I feel confident that um, that, that cost curve will improve, and I feel like, um, you know, there, there's, I don't want to get into the full camera versus LiDAR debate, but I, I feel like um, you, can, you can take what used to be um, implemented in depth sensing hardware and move it to software and cameras if you try hard enough. So there are lots of ways to dig yourself out of that hole between better, better sensors and, and better, better uh, software. But then the thing that blows up even more is even more servers in the trunk to support all that. 
So the place a lot of people look next to um, reduce the cost is how do we take those servers in the trunk and replace them with something that looks more like a few cell phones in its size uh, and, and cost curve power, et cetera. So um, I'm, I'm not the, the first one to think of this. Lots of companies, most principally I'd say NVIDIA, are pushing really hard on um, uh, adapting their hardware, each and each redesign, to be more centered on deep neural nets, which, uh, which um, tend to be the most energy consuming and, and uh, compute consuming piece of the neural net of the uh, autonomous vehicle stack. Um, perception also tends to be the most um, uh, compute consuming piece of the autonomous vehicle stack, uh, as evidenced by the fact that a lot of the control algorithms only really run in the, the CPUs, in fact. So um, these folks are pushing really hard. I think there's a lot of questions about, you know, when will the AI chip revolution uh, where things really get skewed towards deep neural net accelerators start. I would argue we're already midway through it. So, um, you know, in 2012, uh, you know, we, we could do on the state of the art GPU at the time, you know, 3.5 teraops. This curve up to a at least theoretical claimed peak of, um, uh, or sorry, yeah, of, of over 112 teraops um, far outstrips Moore's law. And the way this happened is not so much about better transistors, uh, it's about um, actually having a good chunk of this GPU dedicated to doing 4x4 four four matrix multiplies uh, in, uh, in low bit width math. Um, so this, you know, this fairly mainstream device, compared to startups at least, mainstream device, um, uh, does a lot of the tricks that most people have been talking about for years uh, commercializing in deep neural net processing hardware. Now what's not so good is um, uh, how little memory has improved in this time. So um, when you think about a computer system that will implement algorithms, say deep neural networks, what you want is to be able to feed enough bytes to, uh, of, of temporary variables, of, of parameters, of whatever, to the processor so it can stay busy and get work done. So you can have this issue of being what's called bandwidth bound. So if you don't have enough memory bandwidth for your algorithm, no amount of compute is, is going to to help, and you'll, you'll just wait around for memory to load. So the ratio of computation to bandwidth has um, gotten an order of magnitude worse with the advent of this hardware, because while from K20 to V100, the gigaflops per second uh, you know, improved by uh, you know, um, close to an order of magnitude, uh, memory bandwidth only went up by about four and a half X, uh, which, is, which is relatively uh, kind of like nothing. Um, same issue in mobile and small devices. So um, if you look at what's, you know, uh, sort of, you know, back, back, in, back in the early days of deep learning, uh, a lot of people from, from the group I was in at UC Berkeley worked on implementing deep neural nets and mobile devices as early as 2013. Um, one of the devices we looked at uh, was, you know, um, the, the fairly standard uh, uh, set of GPUs that uh, ARM offers in mobile. Um, and you know, you get a computation to bandwidth ratio of 9.3, which is livable. You know, you don't have to be that clever with your algorithms and implementations to get pretty high utilization of that, of that uh, GPU. Um, but today, um, things are skewed at least as badly in mobile as they are in servers. So um, even, you know, kind of fairly, uh, uh, kind of uh, relatively low cost Chinese silicon like Huawei, you know, they're doing neural net accelerators. They're using the same uh, DDR4 technology that they were using last year before they had the neural, neural net accelerators. Uh, that blows out the compute to bandwidth ratio quite badly. Um, NVIDIA Jets and Xavier, they're a little cagey on numbers, but according to my friend Brian Cottonzaro there, uh, VP of Applied AI, one of my former lab mates at Berkeley, um, these numbers are, are more or less correct. And this compute to bandwidth ratio is, is the worst I'd ever seen when I, when I started looking at this chip uh, last year. So that's where we are now. Um, and if not clear, the implications of this are the worse your compute to bandwidth ratio, the higher it is, the narrower the set of computations that you can do that will fully utilize the hardware. So what do the next generation servers look like? You know, what, where, where are we headed? So there are a lot of claims out there. You know, um, we can take these at face value uh, for the sake of analysis. Um, we'll see what actually materializes. You know, I see things talked about you know, between Mythic, Grok, and uh, Sentient as uh, just a representative sample of, of a newer breed of silicon companies that are focused entirely on deep neural nets without any need to cover things like graphics. 
uh, they're claiming um, anywhere from four to 20 tera operations uh, per watt. So the reason tera operations per watt is an interesting metric is, or sorry, really tera operations per second per watt. That's interesting because it's, it's free of any constraints on what size is your device. It's just saying, um, you know, given a 200 watt ship, you know, you multiply that number by 200 to get, to get how much you, you could, you could uh, theoretically run. So um, this is getting increasingly um, sort of speculative or estimate oriented because we haven't seen this next generation of, of ships yet in the flesh for the most part. But I, I've reproduced you know, the, the K20 and V100 numbers here. Um, I've added a column about, uh, I'm now talking in tera ops rather than giga ops because uh, things are, are moving forward that way. Um, I've added a column for tera ops per second per watt so that we can kind of abstract away you know, whether we're talking about a small chip or a big chip wattage wise. But um, let's say that we look at one of these chips that's claiming 20 tera ops per watt for common deep learning operations. And let's say that we're looking at a device where half of the wattage is applied to that chip uh, for computation and the other half is applied to memory and other pieces of, of the system. So that gives us, uh, a, for a 250 watt system, 125 watts to work with. 125 times 20 should give you 2,500 tera ops per second, best case. Um, but if you look at the um, trajectory that the memory industry is on, um, memory is only getting uh, sort of doubling in speed uh, per watt um, by, on, on a good cycle, 2x over about four years. So um, high bandwidth memory two, uh, which is arguably the thing that comes after GDDR5 or six, or a higher end alternative, um, has been around in common use since about 2016-ish. Um, and the projection is that in 2020, high bandwidth memory three, HBM3, will come out and be twice as fast as that um, with, with all else such as wattage held equal. But you know, if, if, you get, if you go from that V100 to the 20 tera op per watt theoretical device, um, and it's doing 2,500 tera ops per watt, or tera ops per second, um, and you're, you're just using you know, the, the natural progression of memory to HBM3, you're talking about over 1,000 computations per byte. So you actually have to compute 1,000 things before you load the next thing or store the next thing to memory. Um, and there's a very narrow set of deep neural nets and algorithms that actually meet that constraint. Um, if you don't do that, it will still run, but it will be really slow. So from my perspective, to kind of conclude this section, um, what, I see had, uh, what I see going on is, well, and we asked, will the next generation of chips sort of solve all our problems, get rid of the server in the trunk, and so forth? And the answer is, I think it will help, but you know, um, it's sort of an Amdahl's law issue where you, know, you, you, you fix one bottleneck and all these other bottlenecks such as memory uh, emerge. And so I think the reality is um, you know, we're, we're going to enjoy some benefits from these next gen and next next gen chips, but we also have to um, uh, dramatically rethink how we design our deep neural networks um, to take advantage of them and really for real deliver on that promise of going from uh, multiple kilowatts of servers in the trunk down to something that's hopefully close to being negligible, uh, that consumers could get their hands on easily uh, in mass-produced vehicles. So um, I, I tend to call this concept, you know, we've, we've intermittently call it small neural nets or, or sometimes we call it squeezing AI. So when I talk about, when I use the word squeeze, what I mean is to make an AI system use less resources uh, by whatever means necessary. So by resources, depending on the system you're on and the constraints you're dealing with, those might be how much memory out you've allocated, your memory footprint. Uh, it could be your memory bandwidth, you know, how much data are you actually transferring between your chip and the memory that's near the chip on, on your, your board, but is actually off chip. Um, how many computational operations? This tends to be the most popular thing to try to minimize, although as I mentioned before, compute is getting very close to free and all this other stuff is just as expensive as it used to be. Um, power and energy are very important. Um, power being kind of a hard ceiling on how much heat you can dissipate and how much your chip will actually uh, draw. Uh, energy being something to optimize. And then uh, I look at time as a resource just like anything else. So you know, how many frames per second or how can we reduce the, the runtime of these algorithms. And then by means, you know, we look at um, you know, designing new deep neural network models that can be done manually or automatically that can involve 
Um, changing the neural net structure, which as I'll get to, is something that can be partially automated. Um, it may also involve inventing new math, which so far is more a human inspiration, an engineering kind of thing, than a fully automatable process. Um, it can require, uh, or can, it, can, it can be benefited by doing quantization and pruning, which may vary uh, in terms of the right scheme based on what hardware you're on and uh, what your application looks like. Uh, we can implement it better. You know, if you look at the actual libraries and frameworks that we're running, we can, there, there's always room for improvement there. Um, often in a hardware, uh, you know, per hardware platform, you can make further refinements and optimizations to your implementation. And then finally, you know, when, you, when you train, you know, gathering better data uh, and rethinking your, your, your loss function, other parts of your training, um, can improve accuracy, um, but, but can also um, broaden the range of neural nets that will train correctly to achieve your, your desired results. Uh, and that range may grow to include neural nets that uh, fit more nicely on your hardware. So um, let me do a, a bit of a review of, um, we, we showed what, what you know, we want the car to see, uh, at least abbreviated. Uh, we talked about why we want neural nets to be smaller. Uh, what are these two things actually, how do these unify? So um, most computer vision or more broadly perception uh, applications rely on a relatively small set of core uh, problem statements or core capabilities. So um, there's image classification, but for, for autonomous driving, a surprisingly broad variety of problems reduced to object detection or semantic segmentation. Uh, detection being, you know, drawing uh, boxes around objects, uh, estimating uh, what kind of object is it, what's the 3D position. We, we talked about this earlier. Uh, semantic segmentation being classifying everything, every pixel uh, or every point in the LiDAR scan based on what kind of object is this a member of. Um, and uh, more generally, these all are, are basically regression or classification problems. Um, detection being a little bit of an oddball and you have to estimate um, a bunch of coordinates. But many of the other things we do, not just semantic segmentation, but say depth estimation, are basically uh, tensor to tensor computation. So you input an image or multiple images or LiDAR scan or whatever, and then you output more or less the same data structure that's been annotated automatically by your model. Um, you could even do that for um, estimating uh, the depth or the 3D shape of the environment. Um, so uh, as a result, there's a, uh, you know, if you can solve one of these well with a good neural net, chances are you could train that neural net to do a bunch of things like this. But um, uh, one of the most glaring problems, which I, I kind of foreshadowed earlier, is we need a very different kind of deep neural network. So models like VGG16 and ResNet and ResNext have, have been very popular. Um, I think when you're looking at a, a, a cloud-based server environment, or maybe even a bunch of servers in the trunk, you can get away with things that are this computationally intensive, you know, running at many gigaflops per image, even for relatively small images, potentially even blowing up to teraflops per image for large images. Um, but when you look at embedded devices today, as well as, as I talked about earlier, the embedded uh, lower end devices of tomorrow, um, particularly with their constraints and memory bandwidth, um, this tends to really not be the right approach. So a few, a few insights about what we want instead of this. What would be better? So um, one, one observation is um, speed, you know, throughput, or you know, um, uh, how, how uh, latency uh, as well, it tends to be more related to memory accesses than computational operations. Um, so basically, the insight is if you have to go off chip to retrieve something, and unless that you're retrieving something that you're going to use in the far future, uh, that's what's going to kind of gr take the whole operation, uh, make it grind to a halt for, for quite a while. Um, so that's an issue. Um, basically, uh, talking to off-chip DRAM or even worse, disk is kind of the, the, the thing you just want to remove from your, 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 your bag of tricks as much as you possibly can. Um, similar, similar thing with energy. So, uh, this is a study by uh, Mark Horwitz's group at Stanford. Um, this is using uh, older technology before the deep neural net revolution, um, uh, older transistors as well as more basic just CPU processors. So, um, but just on that, you know, there's a, uh, a several order of magnitude gap between doing a computation um, and accessing something off chip. Uh, accessing caches on chip also is not cheap but it's much, much cheaper than going off chip. So anything you can do to avoid falling off your chip in terms of spilling load or having to reload parameters every image or things like that, 
um, is, uh, is really, really good for energy and speed. Um, and again, I, I, I think uh, this has actually uh, gotten worse potentially by at least a couple more orders of magnitude, this gap with the latest technologies. So um, this is something that, um, you know, between uh, Kurt Kreutzer, who I, I guess I didn't really introduce earlier, um, uh, he's one of the, the co-authors on this talk, but Kurt Kreutzer actually is my former PhD advisor at Berkeley, and he's also my co-founder at DeepScale. So um, Kurt and I have been working on squeezing neural nets into small places for uh, close to half a decade now. So um, by 2016, we'd already explored on the order of 10,000 configurations of deep neural nets. Uh, by configuration, a uh, unique configuration to me is a unique neural net architecture or topology, uh, and uh, also its training regime. So, you know, um, you know, in reality, more like a thousand architectures, each trained 10 different ways. Um, and we were super lucky to have access to uh, a supercomputer at Oak Ridge National Lab through some, some friends at Berkeley that, uh, that made a lot of this, this possible because as you may know, uh, compute tends to be one of the most important things to have access to when exploring the, the design space uh, or when training neural nets, uh, even if you're doing it pretty efficiently. So the punchline here was that, so at the time, the, the most widely cited and probably most widely used deep neural net for computer vision applications, uh, definitely for image classification, but extended to other applications like detection, uh, was AlexNet or models based on AlexNet. Um, so you get about 80% uh, top five accuracy in those days with AlexNet uh, and have around 240 megabytes of parameters. With SqueezeNet, which was simply an entirely new neural net uh, design that we came up with, with uh, new, new layer dimensions, new, new organizations of layers, um, uh, we got that down by, by 50x. So down to just 4.8 megabytes. And the um, aha here was, if you look at an embedded processor that might have on the order of 10 megabytes of, of on-chip memory total, um, uh, not DRAM, not off-chip, but on the chip, um, you could store the, the parameters of the model and you could store its temporary variables if you're running at a low batch size, like batch size one for real-time applications, and never fall off the chip. You, you just eat you know, images, do all the processing locally, spit out the results, and you could unplug the memory and it would still work. Um, so uh, this, you know, Naturally, things have moved a long way since then, which I'll get to. Um, but this was an immediate success in embedded vision. Um, uh, companies ranging from the embedded hardware company NXP to um, Facebook and Qualcomm have uh, showcased uh, various SqueezeNet-based models uh, doing great things. Um, SqueezeNet has become part of the source code of most deep neural net frameworks now. Um, and it's sort of a standard reference model that lots of people uh, uh, use as inspiration uh, or even use in their, in their work. Um, but uh, we didn't stop there, so uh, squeeze debt is a squeezed down model for object detection, um, you know, localizing and classifying objects and images. Uh, it's uh, uh, the time won a best paper award at, at CVPR Embedded Vision Workshop, um, really kind of advanced the state of the art on the trade-off between accuracy and speed in these problems, uh, runs quite well on mobile devices. And then we have squeeze seg, which is uh, semantic segmentation for LIDAR. Sorry, people want to take pictures, I, I can wait. Yeah, uh, pictures are good, yeah. Cool. Um, so, so the range of applications just gets broader from here. So squeeze seg, um, semantic segmentation for LIDAR. So this is classifying the type of every LIDAR point in terms of what object type it goes with. Um, uh, required uh, a lot of rethinking of the neural net design um, uh, to, to make this work. And um, I think this is one of the, you know, this, this was not just um, solving an existing problem better, this was framing a slightly different problem than people had been solving, um, oriented towards what we need for autonomous cars. So these and many other models comprise what we call the squeeze family, um, which is a, a whole range of, of nets that uh, Kurt and I and our, our extended academic family have developed over the years. Um, most of which are open source and uh, uh, include training code and things and are easy to find online. Um, we're certainly not the only ones who've been working on this, um, particularly since the, the SqueezeNet paper in, uh, in early 2016. Um, there have been a number of other efforts that have been uh, quite successful. Um, one of which is, that's worth mentioning is uh, work by Andrew Howard and his, his um, collaborators at Google. So they, they have this family of work called MobileNets. 
Um, and I think one of the most interesting thing they, things they did was to popularize an approach called depth-wise separable convolutions, which um, uh, uh, has uh, basically just one channel per filter in the three by three filters. Papers describe it quite well, but that, that helped particularly improving the amount of uh, computation required. Um, they didn't optimize so much on the uh, memory requirements, but as you can imagine, you know, for each platform, your goals and trade-offs with those are different. So particularly for embedded uh, uh, processors on like ARM-based mobile phones using the CPUs, um, these are actually pretty good models. So one thing that sometimes happens when we talk about this stuff is people sort of conflate uh, a, a pretty uh, niche piece of the squeezing neural nets problem with being the whole problem. And what I mean by that is, um, so model compression, uh, so sometimes when I talk about squeezing neural nets, they go, oh yeah, model compression, right? So model compression, basically taking a model that's been trained and then further compressing it by deleting parameters or reducing their bit width and things is certainly a key part of the problem, and we, we, we do it as well. Um, but to think that just taking a, a model like VGG or ResNet that's been training your application and compressing it will, will be optimal is, is not, not really true. Um, uh, so it's a bit like if you wanted to take a watermelon and make it fit into a smaller space, you just kind of take it with a, a hammer and kind of beat it, right? It, it'll help a bit, but you know, maybe not exactly the, the thing you want to focus on. So um, deep neural net architecture search, uh, or whatever method you use to discover brand new deep neural networks, um, tends to be, I would say, more the backbone and kind of the, the thing you want to start with. Um, it's more like saying, I'll just grow the watermelon uh, to fit the, the constraints that I've put around it. Um, and, uh, and then if I, I feel uh, interested to beat it with a hammer later, I, I could go ahead and do that. Um, uh, um, I don't wanna, I'm not trying to beat up a model compression, it's just kind of a memorable analogy, I would say. Um, I borrowed this from, from Warren Gross at, at McGill and found it to be a bit humorous. So um, when it comes to architecture search, I think where uh, a lot of people uh, kind of, um, the hurdle you have to clear uh, and the, the hurdle that people initially struggle with is, well, I got a deep neural net off the internet. It's kind of like a program. If I modify it, I might break it, so that's bad. Well, actually, um, deep neural nets comprise an infinitely large design space, and there are many things in a deep neural net design space that you can modify, uh, which, uh, which probably won't hurt much and might actually make things work better. So let me just talk about what some of those are. And to do that, I'll kind of introduce first um, the anatomy of a convolution layer. So um, convolution in deep neural nets, particularly convolutional neural nets for vision and and uh, 2D and 3D applications kind of have a definition of their own. So the kind of core piece of this, kind of wander over here for a minute, um, so that orange box there, the, that, um, that's the data structure that these things are comprised of typically. So it's uh, a, a tensor with a height and a width and a number of channels. And um, your filters look like that, your convolution filters look like that, um, your inputs look like that, and your outputs look like that. Um, and then you have a series of kind of like matrix multiplications, but with a couple extra loops that, uh, that run these filters um, uh, you know, up and down, left and right, um, on these, these grids. Um, so when you start looking at a neural net and how to change it to use uh, less resources, um, one thing that's definitely worth looking at is how many, fil or how many uh, what's the height and width of your filters? Um, because often what you might start with is overkill. So, um, you know, in, in convolutional neural nets, I often see people using three by three filters, uh, with three by three by number of channels filters for most of the net. And the reality is you want some spatial resolution in your filters, but you can get away with an awful lot of filters that are just one by one, where they're doing rotations across the channels of, of intermediate variables, but they're not uh, aggregating across, across the spatial domain. And actually, um, you can, replace a surprising number of three by threes with one by ones in most nets before the accuracy starts to degrade. And uh, uh, each three by three you place with a one by one uh, has nine x fewer parameters for that, for that filter, and that adds up quickly. Um, there's also what we call um, channel reduction. So um, reducing, basically there's this quadratic effect that people might uh, on the surface uh, mistake as being a linear effect, um, which is if I have a series of layers that I'll have the same number of um, uh, filters, and let's say I start out with 384 filters per layer, and then I, so, so this, uh, this orange box on the left, bottom left, that's a, sort of an example net to start with that uh, has a long series of, of filters that are, or, or layers that have 384 filters. Um, 
If I change that 384 to 128, for example, cut it by a factor of three, I have three X less filters, but the surprising part for some people is I also have three X less channels per filter because um, the number of filter or number of channels in your current layer is actually dictated by the number of uh, filters in your previous layer. So this is sort of, you, you tune this knob a little bit and, and the um, uh, resource requirements actually tend to, 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 to move wildly. Um, so there, there's a lot more here, um, but uh, you know, to, to, try to try to make some forward progress. Uh, so there's, there's model distillation and compression. Um, this, um, uh, this is something I think you, know, that you wanna do in a po basically as a post-processing step. After you've discovered a net that works pretty well, you, you want to um, uh, potentially train it to replicate a better net. Um, that's, that's the thing that actually helps quite a bit. I was actually skeptical of this area at the beginning, but this particular paper here, I, I think has kind of proven in that this approach is really pretty effective and, and at least buying you a couple more accuracy points. So when you look at kind of the deep neural net architects palette, if you will, um, you know, a sampling of what's on there are, uh, um, you know, three by three convolutions, point wise convolution, uh, depth wise convolution, which is where instead of having uh, every filter span all the channels, you have the filters only span one or very low number of channels. Channel shuffle and shift are both pretty recent innovations, relatively speaking, um, uh, of, of how to get more uh, mileage out of fewer filters and less computations. Um, so these are the kinds of things people, people do. You know, if you think about uh, channel shuffle or shift, uh, these were, uh, again, recently invented. Anybody could invent a new one of these layers or, or tricks at any time, uh, maybe you. Um, so kind of integrating all this. So if you, if you really want to do a deep dive on, on this stuff, there's like a 10-page-ish paper that, that Kurt and I wrote called um, Small Neural Nets Are Beautiful. Uh, it, was, uh, it was presented as an invited keynote at uh, uh, Embedded Systems Week 2017. And we kind of go through, you know, blow by blow, what are the things that, that we know how to do? And then when you unify them, what's the multiplicative effect by doing all of them at the same time uh, on uh, reducing uh, memory traffic, reducing compute, uh, so forth? And how can we do that uh, with, uh, well, well, minimally or not at all impacting uh, accuracy? So taking a step back and thinking about this, um, you know, the artistic, uh, process that engineers uh, do to design a deep neural net, uh, manual design, uh, each iteration uh, to evaluate a, a point in design space, quite expensive. Uh, exploration tends to be limited by human imagination. Um, you know, kind of, you know, go through this, this sequence of things, kind of look at the result, go back, try something else. Um, and the question is, uh, can we automate this? Or maybe more to the point, uh, what aspects of this can we automate? So, um, they're uh, sort of led by, by Kwok Lee. There's a glut of papers lately on neural architecture search. Um, uh, entertainingly, uh, SqueezeNet was actually discovered by a relatively automated type of neural architecture search. When we published that paper, nobody really wanted to, really understood what that was about. Uh, now everybody thinks, or lots of people think neural architecture search is gonna help. Um, but one of the main issues is, uh, how do we do automated neural architecture search? We're gonna search lots of models, but uh, you know, not spend kind of you know, ridiculous amounts of computation. So there's this paper, um, uh, I guess I didn't include the, the link, but if you, if you Google DNAS, you'll find it, that uh, my former lab mate, Bi Chen Wu, uh, Kurt Kreutzer, and some folks at Facebook did called DNAS, or Differential Neural Architecture Search. And they're able to make uh, incredibly fast progress in searching the neural, neural net space um, uh, with, with very little compute resources. Um, uh, with, there, there are a number of, of tricks they use to make it so so the, the total amount of training you have to do to explore lots of nets is a lot smaller than you'd expect. And putting this in context, um, so uh, you know, if you look at kind of the, the size uh, of this, um, that's the amount of uh, floating point operations, the amount of flops used to search the architecture space. Um, and uh, as you can imagine, this is, it's, it's, it's not linear, you know, a little bit bigger means actually way more. Um, so uh, that's, that's, the, that's the search cost, basically, uh, in flops. Um, the x-axis uh, is, is, um, is uh, computation, or sorry, the x-axis is computation, y-axis is accuracy. So where you really wanna be is in the top left. Um, and, uh, and the DNAS stuff uh, gets there uh, with, uh, with a minimal amount of computation and actually starting, you know, one thing you might ask is, well, did you just start with a really good net and improve it a little bit? No, most of these actually, including DNS, start with a pretty naive net 
and, and, uh, and rapidly iterate towards a much better net design. So this is looking at flops, which is an OK metric, but uh, on different platforms, you know, different types of operations, uh, you know, different, type, different, different matrix dimensions and so forth uh, are cheaper and more expensive. Um, also, some platforms uh, you know, respond better or worse to reductions in flops. So one thing that, that my colleagues did in the DNS work is to um, not just uh, target flops, but actually in the inner loop of their optimization to look at how fast this actually runs, uh, these different nets run on target compute platforms. And so um, what's interesting is um, the DNAS work discovers not just one net, but a range of nets that are good for different things. And the DNAS's kind of favorite net that hits this 73-ish percent top one accuracy constraint on ImageNet um, for the iPhone 10 and the, the favorite net for the Samsung S8 are different. Um, and uh, if I have more time, I go into why, but basically uh, one of them is uh, much more minimal to five by five convolutions, one's more minimal to three by threes, and there are a bunch of other smaller effects as well that go into this. Um, what's interesting is the iPhone 10 and Samsung uh, S8 both use ARM-based processors, and it's just targeting the ARM processor for this, not the custom neural net accelerator yet. And um, even on almost this, what we think is a very similar computer architecture and a very similar memory subsystem and a pretty similar library, um, you know, you get factors of, of uh, you know, 25% or more uh, you know, depending which platform and which net combination. So there's, I think, this is a, a basic example of, for, for very similar platforms, choose, you know, choosing the right net for the platform is important. I think as we head towards this kind of, as Jensen Huang calls it, Cambrian explosion of different neural net accelerators coming out, we'll see wild, uh, sort of wild swings in, you know, for this neural net accelerator, you really want this net design, for that one, you want that one, and if you get them wrong, you're, you're off by a factor of 10 in speed or something like that. Um, so I'm getting towards the end here. I think the, um, uh, the thing I'd like to encourage in the future is to see people start to break down the wall between deep neural net design and hardware design. Um, one issue I see is uh, there are deep neural net designers who you know, they've, got, they've realized that flops are kind of important, but the, the finer points like uh, arithmetic intensity, uh, otherwise known as the flop per byte ratio uh, of, of the, the algorithm, um, floating point versus fixed point cost, uh, how the memory really works are kind of foreign, you know, not, not something they're paying too much attention to. And then the hardware architects are kind of uh, sometimes often in no man's land optimizing the crap out of sort of ancient history uh, neural nets that uh, have, been, have long since been abandoned uh, or, or moved beyond. Um, so uh, what I'd like to see is these people kind of come together um, and uh, jointly iterate on what do we want to compute uh, uh, and then how can we get the hardware to do it and, and, and do that. Um, in, uh, if you, if you uh, look on, on, on Kurt's research page, uh, we actually uh, have done some work where we put hardware designers and deep neural net designers in the same room uh, and great things uh, in some cases have happened. So I think I'm about out of time here. Um, so key takeaways, kind of taking it from the top again uh, to how we got to, to the side of the part of the discussion here. Um, autonomous vehicles currently need uh, a ton of compute hardware. Um, processing, uh, you know, literally com computer processing uh, is on a uh, trajectory of rapid improvement in operations per watt for neural net style workloads. But other aspects of the system that are not explicitly part of the processor, um, like memory, are improving much more slowly and there are far fewer kind of uh, breakthroughs projected on the horizon. Um, today's neural nets uh, will be choked by slow memory on tomorrow's DNN accelerators. Um, we're already seeing this and I see an opportunity uh, likely, a likely scenario, actually, of it getting an order of magnitude worse or more uh, just the next couple of years. And so I think the way to dig ourselves out of this is um, to design uh, new, new neural nets that are, are smaller, uh, kind of squeeze down uh, all aspects of the algorithm as much as we can. Uh, it'll make full use of these next generation computing systems, uh, reduce hardware costs to autonomous vehicles, and ideally enable lower cost, larger scale rollouts of autonomous vehicles and far more scenarios than just autonomous urban taxis. Thanks. Thanks, Dr. Ian Dola, for a very interesting talk. We have a few minutes for questions. Who had the first one? Uh, so, <clears throat> Jochen Basler. Uh, you have presented the problems that occur 
from transferring neural networks, which are basically a structure designed for biological hardware, onto a von Neumann architecture where we have processors and RAM, and then we run into all those problems that the processors are faster than the RAM and so on. Uh, is there any serious approaches at the moment to implement those neural networks in suitable hardware structures that do not contain adders and multipliers, uh, but that really execute the, uh, the, the neural network as it is? Sure, yeah, let, me, let, me, let me look at that for a sec. So first of all, um, I think the bio-inspired aspect of neural nets are overhyped. Uh, so when we look at deep neural nets, I agree they're deep, I agree they're kind of networks, I don't think they're neural. Um, I think they're actually a, st a stack of glorified matrix multiplies. Um, and so we actually know how to do matrix multiplies in hardware really well, we just don't know how to feed it with memory very well. Um, so if you can make the matrix multiplies of sizes that fit in hardware well, Bob's your uncle. Um, I think uh, if you look at the neuromorphic computing efforts that are out there, uh, I mean, uh, there's IBM True North, which, which I think really hasn't gotten off the ground. Um, there are some folks in, in San Diego who tried some things and, and really didn't go, go too far. Um, uh, I think we can do a lot of what we want with um, von Neumann architectures and particularly fairly matrix-oriented computing. Um, uh, I, I think the, the problem, the, at least um, getting the stuff that I'm personally trying to run uh, deep neural net-wise to run better um, doesn't require a full reboot of computer architecture. I think the open question is, um, you know, is there an opportunity? Okay, so the thing we have to invent for your idea to work is a way for neural nets to uh, sort of um, automatically figure out when to expand and how to allocate connections. Currently, that's all done based on neural architecture search or manually. So if that were to happen and the connections turned out to be, you know, having them in rigid matrices was, was just not what we, we want, then what you're, you're doing is, is kind of interesting. But we actually don't know the right structures uh, that would, would, would meet those, the, that would have those requirements yet. Sorry, quick. Uh, does the uh, uh, quality of the recognition by the neural net improve with the underlying image quality? Oh, or for does sure. The computational cost also uh, decline if you've got a better image. Mm hmm. Is I believe that it does. Um, I think, uh, from a couple perspectives, um, one, um, uh, having just less you know, images with less artifacts, right, is great. Um, I think makes training easier, makes the end results better. Um, I think, uh, second, um, uh, if, you can, if you can get more, more resolution, that, that sort of increases your degrees of freedom. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I think ultimately, your point, I think, is that if, you, if your images are better, you actually probably have to spend less computation, both at training and inference, uh, dealing with artifacts, mm -hmm. right? So I, I think yes. And then just uh, quickly, is there any quantification of that trade-off, or is that, has that not been studied? Good question. Um, I think a lot of the mistakes, or like a lot of that trade-off that I've seen has been less a function of making uh, cameras, for example, way better, although I'm interested in that. And it's been more uh, kind of when you see some sort of foul ball in terms of, you know, kind of smeared images from video artifacts or things, uh, that's sort of a pain. So I think just getting everything up to a reasonable baseline is probably the first problem. Um, and then, yeah, maybe we should talk offline. I, I, don't ha I don't know exactly uh, what to ask for from the camera experts. Maybe I should have come in with that. <laughs> Fritz Lebowski, ST Microelectronics. Thank you very much for this wonderful talk, which stimulates very fundamental uh, elements, which is the first component. How do you make people, the engineers of today, think differently that they go your direction? And the second one is, with what you have today, how you make that transformation happen, that it fits in with that new logic. Do you have some thoughts to share about this? Sure. So first of all, how do we get um, people from the neural net design, uh, software implementation, and hardware communities working better together? Uh, I think the best way, actually, is to have a big challenge problem, uh, like um, you know, making cars able to see, and uh, uh, have those close collaborations be there in service of getting over some threshold of, of trade-offs, right? Or, you know, achieving some set of trade-offs. And, you know, right now we're working with a number of hardware companies 
who are surprisingly receptive to our, our feedback uh, on, a, on a frequent basis. And, and you know, I, I think it's, it's uh, heartwarming that a 30-some-odd a person startup uh, actually gets to influence the next generation uh, hardware of, of, you know, kind of 30-year-old hardware companies who, who do billions a year in revenue. Um, I think um, it would be nice to be in a spot where, we're, you know, I personally, we're, we're involved in every aspect of the stack and building it. But um, as you can imagine, um, putting every single piece of that under the, the same roof can, can get really expensive for any one player. So basically, um, I think the collaborations that I'm describing um, are already happening. Um, so, sorry, your second question was? Got it. Yeah. I think I saw one more question. Oh, yeah, great. Yeah. So in, in terms of the uh, model reduction, or in terms of image quality or imaging in general, so do you find color and uh, resolution? Do you see the difference between them? Can you, in your uh, uh, effort? Can you be more precise? So, so like, a, is a three-channel three colors or half the resolution, which is better? Something I see. Like that, yeah. So I think the reality is we don't necessarily have to pick because the imager isn't the expensive part anymore. So um, you know, if we were looking at if we we're looking at a 2K image, for example, and going, gosh, you know, do we do we want to do we want to have a Bayer mask on here or not or whatever? Uh, well, you know, um, you know, even even the cheapest cell phones now and and reasonably cheap cell phones five years ago had 4K imagers, right? You know, that run at 60 FPS in some cases. So that's not a trade-off I find myself having to make in reality. OK. Um, just one comment, uh, uh, Forrest. Uh, regarding that uh, cameras plus software might uh, replace the uh, LiDAR or as good as, please consider joining our another keynote speech at 11.30. We all have a speaker talking about solid-state LiDAR. And you might pose this question to him. <laughs> So with that, let's thank our speaker again, and uh, 